Good afternoon and welcome to this, the final session of the Gifts to the Golf series from the Sustainable Business Network. I'm Andy Kenworthy from the Sustainable Business Network. Uh, SBN's work in the Gulf centers on business engagement to restore the Maori, the life-giving essence of Te Kapa Moana, Te Moana Nui O Toi. This project received funding from the Gulf Innovation Fund together, a Foundation North initiative, and this event has been supported by Auckland Council. A very great thank you to both of them for making this possible. It's been a fantastic four days. This is the last of the four sessions, and we've put together a unique online event to take a deeper, closer look at this body of water, its current condition, and what we must all do about it. On Tuesday, we kicked off with The Wonders of the Gulf, featuring Auckland MP Chloe Swarbrick and James Frankham, publisher and director of New Zealand Geographic. Wednesday, we had Restoring the Gulf, featuring Michael Mayers, Peter Miles and Mark Russell, all working hands-on and underwater in projects to restore the Gulf back to its former glory. And yesterday was getting plastics out of the Gulf, about the obvious and less obvious impacts of plastics in the Gulf, what we can do about them with Davina Shetty, Darren Tiddy and James Ferrier. All great sessions and all still available on our Facebook page as we recorded them live. And there are prizes to be won uh, on all of those sessions as well. Um, so <clears throat> you can win prizes by taking a pledge to help restore the golf at sustainable.org.nz, gifts to the golf. Um, that will get you in to win a Zilch weekend free car hire or Lewis Road creamy ice cream experience at your office. Register and attend in all four sessions. If you're with us now and you've been with us throughout, you can jump on this one and you can win a double pass on an Auckland Whale and Dolphin Safari. That will get you up close and personal to the golf and see some of the wonders that we talk about here. And today's special prize is a free e-bike hire for a week with big street bikers. All you need to do to win that is comment on the Facebook Live post about what you're doing to help restore the golf, what's inspired you throughout these series about what you're going to do next. Today's session is transport and toxics, looking at the way in which uh, the way that we move around affects the Gulf, some of the pollutants, some of them obvious again, and some of them very not obvious and things that we may not have thought about that are changing the Gulf around us. Today we have Michael Eaglin, the CEO of EV Maritime. He's looking at making ferries electric uh, and a wonderful thing that would be for me personally, um, living out here at Maritai. Kirsten Corson, CEO of Zilch Car Sharing, obviously the lovely people who are letting you win a prize and also doing EV car sharing, which cuts down on your car use and the emissions thereof. And our own Aaron Hooper, Projects and Partnership Manager from, from Millimeter Streams, who has an in-depth knowledge uh, at the heart of our network about the toxics coming out of the transport into the Gulf. We're going to give them each eight minutes to set their stall out and tell you a little bit about their thinking and what they know. Obviously, they know about the solution side and the problems that drive it. And then we're going to get together in a panel discussion at the end. And for that, make sure you pump in your questions to the Q&A section of the, um, on the Zoom chat if you're with us or on the Facebook posts, uh, the live posts there, and we'll pump them through. And I will try and put as many of those to the team as I can. First up, I'd like to welcome Erin, our own, my own colleague and a friend from Sustainable Business Network to kick us off. Erin. Okay. Tēnā koutou katoa. Nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa ko Erin Hooper tako ingoa. Thank you, Andy, and thank you for everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Erin Hooper, and I'm a Projects and Partnership Manager at the Sustainable Business Network, and I've been leading our work in the Hauraki Gulf. Um, so we've been working with businesses to support the reduction of heavy metals that flow into the Gulf, and today I'm just going to give a quick overview of how toxics get into our waterways and talk about the things that we could all do to reduce toxics um, from transport <clears throat> to entering the Gulf. Um, so as humans, we're pretty obsessed with moving around, getting from one place uh, to the next. Um, and the ways that we choose to get around all has impacts on our environment. Um, so everyone nowadays is <clears throat> quite familiar with their carbon footprint in relation to travel. <clears throat> But I bet there are a few of us out there who really think about the other forms of pollutants that um, are a result of our journey. Um, so I'd really love for people to come away from today with a greater understanding of how our transport choices are impacting the environment through toxic runoff um, from our transport choices into the waterways. Um, today I'm going to focus on two main metal toxics that 
enter our waterways and that zinc and copper and explain about the key ways that it gets into our moana. Um, so one of the major issues with toxics from our transport is that it's totally out of sight and out of mind. Um, we've been seeing some really powerful images this week throughout the webinar series, um, you know, particularly of sediment and how that settles on, on the seabed. Uh, Kinnabarans as a result of removing some of those top predators um, and also the plastics in the stomachs of the fish that um, Davina Shetty showed us um, just yesterday. Um, what's more tricky to show visually is the impact of toxic metals from the land flowing into the Gulf. Um, contaminants commonly bind to the sediments and other particles which then settle and accumulate on the seabed. Um, if we go back to um, yesterday's presentation with Davina as well um, and looking at um, plastics and microplastics, there's also research coming out that microplastics are also providing a substrate to which these heavy metals can bind. And then when we see uh, the research of Davina that some of these fish are ingesting these microplastics, it's pretty concerning that what we're doing is, you know, allowing fish to ingest those um, potential toxins. Um, so common sources from road transport include tires and brake pads. So brake pads contain, some of them contain copper um, and tires as part of the galvanization process um, require zinc. Um, we have an infrastructure that supports the quickest way to get water from the roads into our ocean and often there's little to mitigate or remove some of those heavy metals that flow into our moana. Um, <clears throat> common sources from ocean transport includes um, anti-foul paints. So by design, um, anti-foul paints are meant to be toxic to all those encrusting species that want to attach to the hull of boats. Um, and the majority of paints, um, anti-foul paints in New Zealand contain, contain copper as one of those toxins. Um, so I just want to... Um, show you here one image that I was able to find and um, just noting that I've got this from the um, State of Our Gulf Report 2020 um, showing here in Rothsay Bay um, one of the stormwater pipes with some of those contaminants that are just attaching there to the, the stones before it enters the ocean um, and over on the right hand side here um, just got a, um, a graph of the trends from the data that is available um, around the Hodraki Gulf, um, the trends in some of these heavy metals. So I just want to focus on the copper con concentration. So it, it appears that um, there is a decline over the 20 years from um, 1999 to uh, 2019. Um, and there's various reasons why this might be. Um, we've got uh, potentially it could be that there has been a reduction in the copper in the brake pads that we've been using. Also, local measures, um, improving stormwater treatment may have an impact in this. Um, but there are other incidental factors with um, such as increasing sediment load, which would appear then therefore as a um, dilution in copper in our estuary sediment. So there's a combination of factors going on here. It's really tricky to understand exactly what's going on, but um, understanding that we do have an impact on those flows that go into our waterways. If we look at zinc, unfortunately it looks like here with the data that available that it's actually increasing. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have zinc in our tires and as the tires where that enters our waterways. Another key um, place that we get zinc from is actually um, galvanized steel cladding. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, as older buildings that have this, um, as they wear, they also go into our waterways and out to our moana. So I'm just going to talk through now um, this image here about the, the problem that we've got with our brake pads. Um, as we brake, there's friction that causes some of the um, copper component from the brake pad to enter uh, the, the system and, and into our waterways and flow into our um, into our oceans. Um, essentially, an elevated contaminant concentration in coastal sediments affects the survival and reproduction of animals that live on the seabed. And it basically provides a toxic environment for species that live there. Um, 
essentially creating no space for them to thrive. Um, same with zinc as well, as we as the rubber hits the road, um, that wears down and those contaminants can then also flow into our waterways. So what can we do to, um, uh, to reduce our impact um, through with heavy metals um, reaching our Moana? Um, you can be just aware is the number one thing, be more conscious of, of the choices that we have um, and our transport that we use affects, affects the marine environment. The number one thing you can do essentially is just use the car less. Um, you can walk, you can cycle, you can scoot. These have all multiple benefits as well. Obviously it reduces the carbon footprint and also has um, well-being um, benefits too. Electric vehicles um, use regenerative braking um, and the nowadays most electric vehicles are also fitted with low or no copper brake pads. Um, but the fact that there's regenerative braking means that you're using your brakes less and therefore there's less contaminants going into our waterways. You could also ask for low or no copper brake pads when you go to get your brake pads renewed. Um, so these are out there. They're not much more expensive to buy. Um, and yeah, just ask your mechanic next time, next time you need to go in for a service if you can get a um, low or no copper brake pad. Um, take care when driving. If you um, are accelerating quickly and, and then braking hard, you're more likely to wear the brake pads out. So yeah, just be a bit more conscious as you're driving. Um, and then washing your cars on, um, on grass rather than just on waterways uh, on yeah on on the road so you're enabling the um the contaminants to be held and not just flow straight into our waterways so finally i just want to thank um our partners who have made this work possible for us to work with businesses in this way and um, particularly the gulf the gulf innovation fund together who are supporting our work with the businesses to advocate for um, business practice to reduce land-based pollutants um, flowing into the Hauraki Gulf. Thanks, Erin. Top work. Um, it's fascinating, isn't it? It's the, trying to just keep mindful about where things go. It's kind of like tyres. I, I was thinking tyres don't wear out as in W-E-A-R. They wear out as in W-H-E-R-E. -E. The stuff goes somewhere, you know, and we don't really think about that. We just go, oh, tyres worn out. And it was connecting with what we were seeing yesterday is into the stormwater gets basically rinsed into the sea and all this stuff ends up there. So, uh, yeah, and there's a lot of good habits we can get into. And some of them are good habits for other reasons as well. If you don't drive a car like a maniac, then um, drive as little as possible. It will cost you less. It's more efficient all around. So um, it's one of those, you know, if, if we can save the world and do good stuff all at the same time. So thank you very much. We'll come back to you at the, uh, the when we get to come to discussions and keep those questions coming in. There's a few questions already arriving. Um, I'm hoping for more. Keep pumping them in as we go forward. And uh, now over to Kirsten Corson from Zilch EV Car Share, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the kind of revolution in, in vehicle transport, both in the way that we use it and the, and the vehicles that we choose. And she's fittingly in a vehicle even as we speak. Kirsten. Kia ora koutou, nā mihi nui kia koutou. Thanks everyone for coming along today and listening. And Erin, that was an awesome start. Um, and I'll just um, build on a couple of things that you've talked about as well. And uh, yes, I am sitting in a zero emission um, electric vehicle with a low copper brake pad. So you'll be pleased to know. Um, now I'm just going to share uh, my screen with you. So hopefully um, that's coming up live for you. And um, we're just going to have a talk about um, sustainable mobility, really, and how we can um, how we can change and change the thinking of what we're doing currently. And just for those of you who don't know who Zilch is, we started in 2014 as a vehicle leasing fleet management company, as you go. And what we found is we were putting more and more cars on the road. And our GPS was telling us that these cars were hardly moving. And we thought, how could we get electric vehicles, more electric vehicles into fleets? And um, we went, this, this model with leasing isn't really about optimizing and utilizing. So perhaps we could do car sharing with electric vehicles. So that's how it started. And we launched in Christchurch uh, two years ago now. 
and um, and then last year we actually were fortunate enough to um, move away from the vehicle leasing fleet management and have gone out on our own um, as Zilch with Genesis Energy's um, support. So that's that's um, who we are and how we've come to talk to you today. So just building on what Erin was saying around why is it really important to look at mobility and what we're doing and how we're doing it because the impact on the Gulf is just going to be exacerbated. So if we look at these numbers and go by 2023, we're going to see another 2 million people in in Auckland alone. And there's going to be more than 500,000 cars on the road in 2023 as well. So it's uh, at this, we have to change our habits because if we just keep on increasing our population and increasing the amount of cars, it's not the smartest thing to do. So what I really want you to um, have as a takeaway today is how could I be smarter um, with my mobility? And if we look at just at cars, uh, the average car is only used 5% of the time. So we've got a whole lot of um, more cars going on the road, but we're not actually utilizing those as utilizing those well and at the moment in New Zealand um, less than two percent of cars are electric so we've got 98 percent of our fleet plus um, driving around with diesel and petrol and that obviously is having a, an impact on our environment we're also seeing greater congestion um, on our roads and we, when we are driving those cars, we're not actually driving those cars particularly well. We've got the fourth highest accident rate in the OECD as well. So it's time for us to, to look and go, how could we be more sustainable? And I know you guys are all tuned in today. So sustainability does matter and the golf does matter to you. And, and how could you be smarter and, and which is wonderful. And what we're seeing is this is an increasing trend. And obviously what's happened this week with the government announcing a climate emergency um, is really putting the spotlight. And if anything, we're going to see these numbers increase. So people are really starting to look in more depth um, around sustainability measures. And when, you know, so many people we see um, getting into cars and buying cars and and going it's okay my next car is going to be an electric vehicle um, but it's 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 quite astonishing to think for emissions in New Zealand from vehicles are 20 percent of the problem and when we look at businesses in New Zealand the average um, emissions from a business fleet is 40 percent and when you look at businesses, 70% of new car purchases are coming from businesses. And businesses are generating three times the amount of emissions as private users. So I'm not sure you know, how many of you today are tuning in as private users or tuning in as business users, but you, you all have a part to play in this because those company cars are going into the secondhand market and they're spending on average the next 10 years um, driving around New Zealand. So whether we're looking as a business owner or a private owner, we just need to ask some questions around our fleet. And I went to one of our, um, in our fleet, we've got a lot of Hyundais, um, Konas and Ionics. Um, so I went to Hyundai um, last week and said, look, can you just tell me about the journey that you're going on? And because obviously, um, you, you cars are the core part of your business, but you know, talk to me about how you've transitioned your business. And they they gave me a number of, of slides and this one I really liked and it just showed that transition we're going on. And transitions do take time. You think of going from the horse and cart to the combustion engine took 10 years. And we're seeing the shift from petrol engines through to hydrogen and through to electric engines. So at the moment we're, we're sitting, transitioning from the light green to the green to the blue. And we're going to see that transition increase in speed with the changes that are coming on in New Zealand. And I know when we went to launch Zilch in 2018 and we asked the car manufacturers, 
what is the copper content in your brake pads. Um, at that time, they they didn't know. They went back to the the factories, and copper wasn't even a big um, a big thing. And the factories were struggling to figure out what the copper content of their brake pads were. But now, if you ask a manufacturer what's the copper content of your brake pads, they know exactly what it is. So it's wonderful to see that shift that's happening globally to make these these issues more important and more visible. And, and just touching what on what Erin talked about in, in her slide, you know, what can you do? I absolutely support what Erin is saying. You know, use micro mobility. You know, at Zilch, we think about mobility as a jigsaw puzzle. And depending on your, your needs and your lifestyle and what's going on in your life, you use different parts of the jigsaw puzzle are bigger and smaller. So um, for me, I need to have a car. I live out semi-rurally. So I make sure that that's a shared vehicle and, and it's electric. Um, I also use, if I'm around town, I try to walk. I try and use micro mobility. So use scooters and bikes where possible. So I'd encourage you to have a think about your lifestyle and where you can make some changes. It's wonderful to see the announcement in, in Wellington this week that um, the buses are all going to transition across to electric. That's really exciting. And, and I'd encourage you to, to look at how can you shift um, and use some public transport as well, because um, as Michael will, will talk to us about next, that is transitioning to sustainable and zero emission as well. Another question I'd like to ask you um, is, do you really need to have a private vehicle? And, and New Zealand has got an obsession with cars. Uh, we've got the fifth highest car ownership rate in the OECD. So have a think about actually how much you, you actually use your car. And many businesses and many private individuals, when they actually run the numbers, they realize that the car's costing them a lot financially. And it's costing a lot from carbon emissions if it's not electric and they're hardly utilizing it. So I'd challenge you um, to, to run some numbers and think through that for yourself as well. As Erin spoke about, you know, if you can use an electric vehicle, um, if you can use a vehicle that's got low, low copper or no copper brake pads and, and also a vehicle that's got regenerative braking because um, I know in, in our fleet, you know, when we first started with, you know, two and a half years ago with 100, you know, um, pure electric EVs, um, we haven't replaced one brake pad yet. So that's the neat thing about um, regenerative braking. As Erin said, you don't, you don't need to do them. And I know I was, um, replaced them. And I know I was talking to Eka um, this week and they said for, um, trucking companies, the saving on brake pads and repair and maintenance is substantial. So it, it has a win for the environment, but it has a financial win as well. Now, for any of you that are sitting in um, business environments, um, whether you're leading a business, I would say to you, do you really have to include cars and in salary packages? Because that just encourages people to drive into the drive into work um, each day and, and not use that mobility jigsaw puzzle, whether that's public transport or buses or shared mobility. So I would say, um, I would question um, if you are running a business, do you really need to do that? It's, it's actually also inspiring to see when we go and talk to businesses that they say they've got employees that no longer want a car in their salary package or they're asking for electric vehicles in the company fleet. So, you know, we all have a, um, we all have a voice and I think of, um, you know, that great saying, if you, you think you're too small to achieve anything, think of a mosquito and what they can do in your room at night. So um, I'd encourage you to ask the questions in your own work environment and encourage um, sustainable mobility as well. Now, um, I just thought to wrap up, I'll just give you a, a case study of a customer which um, Christchurch City Council, which I think have shown outstanding leadership. So they, they recognized, and it was about 2016, 
after the earthquakes that they wanted to create a smart city. And they started working on cycleway plans, um, the use of micromobility in the city, and, and, and no longer owning a fleet of petrol and electric vehicles. So in 2018, they sold 50 of their petrol cars and five of their EVs, and they mandated their employees to use Yugo Share, we were called at the time, um, to use Zilch Pure Electric cars. And now that now that business it has over a thousand trips a month, they've saved over 300 tonnes. It's been a cost neutral implementation, and they've reduced the amount of cars in the C, um, CBD. Plus, they've developed sustainable mobility for their entire city. So, you know, I, you know, I, I really salute them because they were very bold. We haven't seen any council achieve the wins like what Christchurch City Council has achieved, and um, they've been real leaders. So that's a, a great example for our country about how you can um, adopt more sustainable mobility. Um, for your business, but you know, also lead your city as well. So, um, as I talked about, you know, there's there's benefits um, with a shared mobility. It's electric vehicles. You know, it's not tying up your capital. It's more tra transparent costs, and and also um, from a health and safety point of view. So, I just wanted to say thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope it's um, given you some aspects that you can think about and consider in your own life and um, I look forward to see you walking or m using micro mobility, public transport, electric vehicles and, and shared electric ones at that and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much Kirsten. A lovely picture of uh, the way that we can move around in our futures and I'm already doing that jigsaw puzzle every day as I get on my bike and then ride to the ferry and then get the ferry and then into the CBD and definitely getting that experience of it's kind of especially for cycling the CBD now there's scooters and there's electric things it's like being in Star Wars it's fantastic and uh, the more the merrier but the big ticket item for me on carbon is still my um, ferry fleet and we'll hear shortly from Michael uh, how we can bring that one down and also remember that you can um, have your own experience with Zilch if you win the prize and take a pledge at sustainable.org dot nz and gives to the golf and do your pledge there for how you can improve the golf you could win a Zilch weekend free car share and uh, enjoy that experience we'll bring up Michael now and see if Michael can bring down the largest biggest item carbon item on my list is my journey to the city on the ferry twice a week michael kia ora everybody nice to uh, nice to be here and thanks for tuning in um we're a maritime technology company focused really on developing solutions which address sustainability issues in the maritime sector um i've been asked to tell you a bit about the ev maritime journey and and how it's developed from initially being very focused on climate change alone into something which is much more sort of deeply connected with the um, advancement of the wider well-being of the Hauraki Gulf. Um, EV Maritime is a uh, clean tech company, but our tech is not deep tech, it's applied tech. So what we do is solid application of knowledge and experience and proven systems into a new package. I'm just going to tempt fate and share my screen here, and uh, hopefully that will work swimmingly. <clears throat> So, and then next thing is whether the slides will move on. One moment, please. Here we go. Uh, our team spent the last two years, I guess, developing electric fast ferries and um, specifically ferries of the scale and capability which is needed for serious urban rapid transit systems like Auckland's. Auckland's ferries today are by and large old and tired and um, their replacement is very much imminent. What EV Maritime has developed is a fast ferry system which can right now deliver 100% electric services to the whole of the Auckland Transport Ferry Network. These boats will save well over a million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions over the life of the diesel boats, which, um, sorry, over the life of the diesel boats which would otherwise be built. So it's a, it's a comparison between uh, a status quo, um, if we leave the system alone, what would happen versus what we can offer, about a million tonnes over the life of those diesel boats. Um, and because the operational costs are so much lower, the entire system entirely self-funds within the existing operational budgets with a bit of money to spare. Um, 
we started this journey uh, with the aim to decarbonize the ferry fleet and the hope that the operational savings would help justify the additional capital investment. We've certainly proven that in spades, um, but our journey and our mission with it has become a whole lot more than that. Um, and that's, I guess, what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Auckland's already got electric trains. Um, our 30 odd ferries in the, in the wider Auckland fleet burn around about half the amount of diesel of Auckland's entire fleet of 1,360 buses. And if Auckland can electrify the rest of its public transport system, that's all the buses and all the ferries, then we'll save something like 4% of Auckland's total transport emissions. So on one hand, that's great, save emissions and save money. Um, it's the lowest hanging fruit we're going to get and we need to stop procrastinating and get on with it. Um, on the other hand, 4% gained by fully decarbonizing the whole of the public transport system doesn't really scratch the surface. So is that someone else's problem or will we have done our part or do we have another role to play? Myself, I'm all about uh, integration, about breaking down silos and achieving system change. And I quickly worked out that yes, we not only had a role to play, we really had a responsibility. Um, our task is not just about decarbonisation, it's about participating actively in changing how people move around our cities. Um, they call it mode shift, getting us out of our cars and onto public transport, bikes, scooters and footpaths. Now, what's going to drive lots more people to leave their car at home and catch a ferry? Uh, it's about passengers and it's about their experience of the system, how we meet their needs, and there are many of them. Reliability, frequency, convenience, resilience, the list goes on and we're working in all those spaces. But to me, one of the biggest opportunities for mode shift lies in better accommodating bikes and scooters on board our public transport services. In particular, I think we're missing a huge trick in the synergy potential of e-mobility and public transport. Believe it or not, not everyone that catches a ferry is a lawyer or an accountant going to the CBD. Some of them are baristas heading to Ponsonby or retail staff on their way to Newmarket or doctors and nurses heading to Grafton or whatever. And with an e-bike, those people can ride further from home to the ferry and further from the ferry to work and still arrive dressed for work rather than sweating and needing a shower. So instead of focusing on providing parking for them at the end of their first mile, our public transport should be finding ways to encourage more of them on board. On ferries, that means wider entrance doors, it means proper civilized racks inside, out of the salt spray, close to the doors. Somewhere to sit near to your bike so you can retrieve it easily. Heck, maybe even somewhere to charge it up. Now, of course, it's not just about cyclists. Ferries are for everyone, and they say everyone loves a ferry. Or actually, everyone that doesn't catch a ferry to work thinks that they would love to catch a ferry. In reality, a lot of our ferries are noisy, rumbly things which actually feel a lot more utilitarian than they need to. It doesn't have to be like that. Electrification will be transformational in itself, slashing the noise and vibrations that we've accepted for too long so you can hear yourself think on board and feel more like you're in an environment rather than smashing your way through one. And rather than making the insides of our ferries look like ferries or like hospital waiting rooms, we should be providing a stylish environment in which to relax. That's how we show respect to our passengers and make them want to use our service more. I think it's absolutely reasonable to aim to double, triple or quadruple the number of people that use our ferries for their daily commute. And that's how we enable change at a far greater level than simply the, safe, the face value of saving uh, the emissions of 30 or 40 boats. But there's a whole lot more. What can a really smart, clean ferry system represent as a piece of civic leadership. It's a little like Kirsten said, where, where she said on her slide, Christchurch City Council provided sustainable transport leadership for an entire city. What can this smart, clean ferry system say about our city and its priorities? Not only eliminating emissions and offsetting hundreds of millions of dollars of fossil fuel imports, but demonstrating care for our environment and respect for our people. An electric ferry network demonstrates visible climate action. It's building back better and leading by example. A quiet, clean, low wash ferry network demonstrates care for our environment and our communities. It's a move away from industrial attitudes 
to minimizing harm, to leaving no footprints. A ferry fleet built with circular economy principles central to every decision and with materials that have half the embedded energy of the status quo aluminium speaks of intentionality, of living truthfully and fronting up to our impacts. And a ferry fleet which is designed aiming for 50 years of service life rather than 20 tangibly demonstrates that we can bring an end to our disposable culture and reject the brief period of consumption which humanity has allowed itself to slip into in our short lifetime. And this brings me full circle to the Hauraki Gulf. Is it just a roadway to serve our ferries or can our ferries serve the Gulf? As we've heard this week, the Hauraki Gulf is in deep trouble. And quite frankly, as a collective, we are actively choosing not to do anything about it. Quite simply, we just don't care enough. So as our company has its roots very deeply in the waters surrounding our city, our challenge to ourselves has been to develop a ferry system which brings people to the point of caring a whole awful lot. How do we do that? Well, most of the people who catch ferries are not nautical people. They're people like Andy. Andy, you might be a nautical person, I don't know. But you catch the ferry primarily to get from the bit of land on your side to the bit of land on the other. The ferry may well be the thing which has brought people to the water in the first place, and it is the medium by which they experience that water. And for those of us that are deeply passionate about the state of our Gulf, that there is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to demonstrate the way we should act towards the ocean, the way we care about what matters, even if we can't see it. We've been thinking, what are we teaching people now through the unspoken things which we say to people through the way they experience our ferries? Our noisy, can't hear yourself think ferries. Our rumbly, bash across the harbor, crash into the dock ferries. Our cheap to buy but expensive to run ferries. What are the grown-ups teaching their kids? And what would our kids like to teach us if we gave them a chance? What would we like to say through our ferries if we could find the words? The point is, the future of ferries is electric. That future is now, but it is so much more than that besides. So when Evie Maritime talks about a better ferry future, that's what we mean. And we think we should demand nothing less as a city. And Thank you so much. That's perfect. Yeah, you're so right. You're so right. And yeah, I mean, I absolutely adore my ferry ride, but a silent ferry ride would be absolutely magical. It would be so magical. And, you know, the times we've seen, you know, we've stopped for dolphins, we've stopped for, for other creatures in the Gulf, and you sort of think, wouldn't it be so much nicer if we hadn't roared up in this massive, you know, diesel thing? And again, looking at my carbon footprint, as I, you know, I actually did, I did the, the sums on it, and I couldn't believe how off whack I was. And I was like, but I'm using public transport. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the ferry. And then I thought, oh, that's why, because they run on massive amounts of diesel, which is, is problematic. It's a massive problem. So thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you to Erin, Kirsten and Michael. We'll bring you all back in now um, and have a wee discussion and throw some of these points around. We've got some excellent questions coming through on our um, Q&A as well. Um, so we'll try and work our way through some of those for you. Um, one of the things I was going to talk about was the, the, that runoff thing that persists. And also, it's interesting that the other point we didn't talk about was oils as well, and all the oils and diesels that come out of the, the standard combustion engine and um, that end up in the waterway as well. And of course, electric vehicles, as I understand it, are much simpler. So there's, the, you don't have that issue, and it feels like a no-brainer. Michael, is that something you've looked at? Uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, when things are operating well, there's not too much liquid stuff that comes out of the engines into the um into the water but there's always a little bit because um we the the um diesel powered ferries are running liquid cooled exhausts and that and the water um uh, comes back out the pipe at the end so um what comes out of the combustion chamber uh, ultimately winds up in the sea um of course there's a whole lot of um soot as well and we've seen um maybe about a year ago there was a, a report that came out about the levels of black carbon in the in the lower cbd area um and of course actually a lot of that is coming from buses and ferries um it comes from burning diesel and they're the big burners of diesel in those areas so um so yeah it's it's not just about carbon that's absolutely right 
Yeah, I was, I, I, there was that report recently as well, wasn't it? Was I think I saw it, which was the um, the big cruise ships that have been told to reduce the emissions from their um, from their exhaust pipes, so they'd cannily just run a pipe down underwater. I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that sorted. Then that's fine. Um, well, we do that. Just... We do that because the the water looks beautiful, and we and we just you know we throw things away, and it's that you know where's where's away? Well, it's in the harbour. Sits on yeah. the bottom, kills fish. That's it in a nutshell across all of these talks. Eh? That, yeah. that we do forget that these stuff are there. Aaron, did you? I mean, you've been. I know you've worked in kind of other marine environments around the globe doing conservation stuff. Were you shocked when because we did our initial report for Foundation North on the Gulf? Were you as shocked as I was about some of this sort of hidden, these hidden issues that we I hadn't really had thought about myself. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, um, you know, the ocean is is a is a massive massive space, so. The, the impacts that we're that we're making and and you know the the small incremental inputs that we are putting into our oceans um, you know happening over hundreds of years and it takes us a while to really see them as, as a large large pro problem um, yeah I mean yeah the, there's obviously ways to change that there's legislation um, and I think you know there's space for New Zealand to to up up its game in legislation to, to stop some of these um, uh, elements running into into our oceans. Um, yeah, we're, we're very much using the ocean as a, a large dumping ground and we have been for too long. And uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing the impacts coming to fruition. Um, and yeah, definitely something that we should be doing more, more about here in New Zealand and taking a stance and being leaders. Mm. And what, what's holding us up, Kirsten? The sort of numbers you talked about the numbers, which is great. Are the numbers playing in our favour, or is it something where there's still an unfair advantage for? I mean, I know people sort of think electric vehicles are too expensive. You can't, you can't have one yourself. How do the numbers play out if you if you use the sort of services that you use, and also just in the in the longer term for EVs? Can you see it being much more accessible? Um, yes, I think we will see EVs become more accessible if we look internationally. And we look at something like car sharing, it's been around for over 20 years. And um, New Zealanders as a whole do have a high attachment to ownership, you know, as I talked about. Um, but we're seeing, like with sharing, we're cheaper than a Lime scooter. So you can have a BMW i3 for an hour and it's going to be less than, than taking a Lime scooter. What I find really funny with Kiwi and is that like, say I was to ask you, Andy, how much does your car cost you? You'll, you'll probably say to me, I don't know, what's your petrol bill? You, right. take it to, you, know, you take it to the garage once a year, so you might say, oh, I spend $40 a week on petrol, and I um, take it to the garage once a year, and that costs me about 500 bucks. So it doesn't cost me much to, you know, for my car. But you didn't you know, calculate in there that you bought that car for 15000 you've had it for five years, when you sell it, you're going to get 5000 for it. So it's that whole, what was the capital cost, time value of money, um, and you you could go, well, actually, if I cycle and, you know, use public transport and you walk and use shared transport, you know, that would be a more cost-effective option for me. So, you know, I, I find it, um, like I saw the news from Auckland Transport last week and also uh, Phil Boff talking about contingency charges. And, and I'm like, that's a great thing. And if you can add to that emissions as well as it is, is charging, that would be a beautiful thing because it will make Kiwis question, should I really be driving a car? Or should I be using public transport or walking or micro-mobility or electric? Yeah, I think the, I think the congestion will be the only will, will probably be the only thing that makes people think. But it's, it's I find it stunning that it doesn't. I've I've ridden a motorbike for years and through through the traffic, uh, um, and then just more recently I took the car out once in about the first time in years at about three p.m. from here, and the traffic was back to back. And I was like, how do people do this? How do they justify sitting in traffic for an hour and a half? And you know, and then contrast that to my, with my lovely ferry ride for thirty five minutes. It's just it's just a no brainer. Um, but I'm in a fortunate position, you know, I'm in a particular location where the, the, the transport nodes kind of connect properly and I work in the CBD. And I suppose the other impact we're having as well is working from home as, you know, as I'm doing now or working from car even. And, um, yeah. you know, 
that how how big a cut do you think that's going to take, Michael? As, as we roll out the sort of the system that you're looking at, is that something you've had to factor in that kind of shift? Um, I think the bigger shift that it's going to have is that it's going to change. Yes, it'll, it'll change peak numbers a bit, but I think that it's um, uh, it's something which is going to um, change the. It's, it's going to spread the load out through the day. If you're working from home, I, I think. You know these these Zoom calls are great, but you know it, it's not quite the same as being face to face. And um, so I think that just means that if we're working from home, we still need to get into town to um, have a face to face meeting with somebody. It's just we don't necessarily need to go in at eight o'clock in the morning and back at six o'clock at night. Um, I've found that myself that I'm actually using public transport more um, um, when I'm working from home than when I was in working from the office. Um, and I do a bit of both at the moment. Um, partly because there's not really anywhere super convenient um the other way but but it's it, it's but it's also because um yeah just, i guess you just think about it more um i can't get to work by public transport um in less than about four times the time that it takes me to get there by by car um uh, because i'm one of the many people who doesn't actually work in the cbd um so, um, but I, I think people are still going to use public transport, but using public transport on off peak schedules, and particularly if we look at the ferries, a ferry that goes every hour or something just isn't viable. Um, or some of the ferries are even less than every hour through the middle of the day. Auckland Transport knows that, um, and they've set out their, their expectations of, of massively increasing frequency through the day. And I, I totally agree with them. And that, that's something that was very much pre COVID, um, pre this work from home idea. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think it's it's going to be a really important part of the um, of the parcel is just making sure there are services all through the day that people can take, and that those mm. services are affordable. Because so we need to act on relatively fast, though. Because uh, Aaron, I was looking at those numbers you were showing, and and I was thinking about the the fact that <clears throat> the the toxic the heavy metals are cumulative. Hey, eh? that's the thing. They're they're bioaccumulative, so they stay in the system. They don't go anywhere. And over decades and decades and decades it just builds up what can you tell us a little bit about the effect of those toxics in 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 the water why are they such a problem what what what, what happens yeah i mean that, that's a major issue there particularly in the Hauraki gulf i mean um they do stay in in the in the benthic um system for a long long time um i think you know the Hauraki gulf is still suffering from mining days um which has has recently been um addressed but um yeah there was there was a huge input of um, heavy metals during mining times which is you know and, and the effects of those are still there um you know a, a key issue for those um you know we have a lot of in fauna so um species that live within the benthic substrate um if they're there um living there they're in that toxic environment and it has impacts on their, their organs so essentially you know livers kidneys um and you know potentially has impacts on their reproduction as well um the the scary thing is i think as well the sort of bioaccumulation so as they go through the tropic levels so as those smaller um species are eaten by the larger species um you know that's something that of, of concern as well so it has a effect throughout the ecosystem um yeah. So, um, yeah. That's the sort of issue we saw in mercury, wasn't it? Where it's like you, you know, eating fish. Why have they got so much mercury in them? It's because big fish eat little fish, you know, and we tend to eat the big fish. And uh, you know, this, we're we're setting we're setting our stall out for some problems in, in our own lives as well. That's the other thing is that you know the, the sea doesn't exist in another world. It exists right on our doorstep, eh? Michael, I was going to ask, how far along are you? I mean, we've got you've got lovely pictures of ferries. Um, how how much building work's been done, and kind of how much interest are you getting? Can can I get one next year, please? Uh, next year, not quite. Now, uh, no. So we haven't started building. COVID was um, was not kind to us in that respect. So we were, uh, I think, very close to starting off uh, some builds. Um, towards the beginning of this year and uh, with a number of, uh, of operators, not just in urban public transport. Um, but unfortunately, um, uh, that's changed things a bit. I mean, the public transport operators are all quite exposed, not only to the, the commuter market, but also the tourism market. And um, where the tourism market would have been able to um, help justify the investment um, pre-COVID, that's obviously not looking so flash right now. 
Um, so um, we are pretty close. We've got um, fully developed boats ready to go, um, existing proven technology. Um, so this is all, the technology is all very much ready. Um, it all stacks up um, financially very well, actually better than we'd hoped it would. Um, so uh, yeah, but we do have to start building something and that's expensive and that needs, um, that needs kind of a combined approach. I mean, it's, it's kind of local government, central government operators, um, and, and that's, a, that's a, a slow wheel to turn, but, but everyone's, um, I think, pushing uh, that wheel in the same direction. So watch this space. Sure thing. Kirsten, you're, you're relatively established. You seem like you might be a little bit further down that road. Have you got any advice or insights on how the, that shift might happen? Um, yeah, a couple of uh, a couple of things, and um, I just wanted to add on to what Michael said in his presentation around um, encouraging micro mobility within um, whether it's public transport or shared fleet. I just I, that really inspired me, Michael. And you know, if you look at the states, sixty percent of trips that are less than eight kilometres are done by micro mobility in the state. So I think, you know, that's a, a big difference compared to New Zealand, 60%, that's huge. So trips that are five miles or less, which is 8K. So I was really heartened to say, you know, to to um, see that in your presentation, Michael, the way that you're looking to adapt. And I was talking to a corporate um, lawyer the other day is negotiating an agreement and I said to him, oh, you'll have to try our cars. They were coming on board as a customer and he said, Oh, I catch um, I, I catch my electric skateboard to work every day and I went brilliant I said that's awesome and you know he was clearly younger than me um, and uh, he said to me um, you know I used to think of of um, lawyers that mentored me used to come to work in their jags and their expensive cars and you know he has a uh, six kilometer trip he does every day to work into the CBD on an electric skateboard. So I, you know, I just think the neat thing that I'm seeing from that younger generation coming through inspiring and, and breaking molds and asking questions and, and really leading. And, um, and that's what I think we need to see from all Kiwis to, to shift it because that's what will create change. Um, and another, you know, another story just linking on to that too. Um, I was talking to the CEO of Genesis Energy and, um, and they've shifted from the office in Green Lane where they had over 200 plus car parks that they provided to their staff. So, you know, when you provide car parks to your staff, it, people bring their cars and they've moved into the CBD and he used to drive his car to work every day. And they've moved into the CBD and they haven't provided any car parks for their staff. They've given their staff a discount on using zilch cars, which is great, but a discount on using public transport. And I said to him, oh, so, you know, how are you getting to work? And he said, well, I'm, I'm catching the bus, which I've really been enjoying. And he goes, I'll start using you guys as well because we're about to open up a new hub. But, you know, what I'd really love to see is leadership within New Zealand really step up and walk the talk and and start using public transport, using micromobility, walking, not including car parks, not um, not including cars and salary packages, because if we've got um, that happening as well as you know you and I and everyone else asking questions and and leading as well, then we're going to create sustainable change. I think it's going to happen. It's, it's sounding like it's happening already. Uh, I'm, I'm, I definitely saw an, an amazing panoply of different electric vehicles suddenly appear in my ferry over a period of about six months of, you know, from the one person, oh, look, look what they got there to suddenly all oh, there's this and there's a skateboard yeah. and there's these. And I think that'll happen generally. And it's, it reminds me a bit with what happened with hybrid cars. There was all sorts of kind of debates about whether hybrid cars were a good idea. And then the taxi firms did the numbers and went, yes, they are. And then they were everywhere. And it's, I think it's going to be a yeah. very similar transition. Well, thank you so much. That's the end of our time together this morning, uh, this afternoon, I should say. Um, thank you so much for your time and coming to us, Michael, Kirsten and Erin. That's the end, of, coming towards the end of our final session of this series. Just a quick reminder and say thank you to um, Gulf Innovation Fund Together, a Foundation North initiative for funding the work that we do in the Gulf 
and to Auckland Council for making these events possible. And do remember there are still prizes available. You can take a pledge to restore the golf at sustainable.org.nz, gift to the golf, and that will get you into win a weekend uh, with Kirsten's lovely cars or uh, some Lewis Road creamy ice cream coming to your office in a special event. You can register and attend. If you've registered and attend all four of these sessions, well done. Thank you so much for being with us. That puts you in to, to win a double pass at Auckland's Wild and Dolphin Safari to get out there and see this wonderful golf for yourself. And today's special prize is free e-bike hire for a week with Big Street Bikers. Comment on the Facebook Live post about what you're doing to restore the golf. Hopefully we've inspired you to take some steps. Go back and view through all the other three um, sessions that we've had. They've all got prizes attached as well, so you can route through there and get involved. And just to say, the Sustainable Business Network's next event is the Now Crowd Christmas Drinks for Young Professionals on the 15th of December. And the Sustainable Business Network's Christmas Drinks for Investors, those of you that are paid up investors with us, thank you so much. We've got our Christmas Drinks coming up on the 17th. They're both in Auckland. You can see more details on those at sustainable.org.nz. And also there you can catch up with all the work the Sustainable Business Network is doing. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you another time.